This is the Mondo Weiss Podcast. I'm Dave Reed. Today we have two interviews from our U.S. correspondent, Michael Aria. First, he speaks with Josh Rubner about the shifting politics around U.S. aid to Israel, and later, he checks in with the victim of an anti-Palestinian smear campaign at Florida State University. We begin with U.S. aid to Israel. The fight in Congress continues to build over the billions of dollars we send to Israel every year. Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen is the latest to call for conditioning U.S. aid to Israel, joining other high-profile figures such as Bernie Sanders, Rashida Tlaib, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and others. At the same time, however, a high-profile delegation of Democrats in the House of Representatives were in Israel meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. This trip was sponsored by the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or AIPAC, and they have been furiously promoting it online over the past several days. Many, if not all, of the Congress members on the trip have filmed videos for AIPAC's social media channels in which they profess their love and admiration for Israel. Phil Weiss, our founder and senior editor, remarked that they looked like hostage videos. So what is happening with the issue of aid funds for Israel? Michael spoke to Josh Rubner about the history of U.S. aid to Israel and the emerging fractures in Congress over this enormous amount of money. Josh is the author of Israel, Democracy or Apartheid State, and Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker Israeli-Palestinian Peace. He is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. So thanks for joining us. I wanted to start maybe with something we've been covering at the site for the last couple weeks now, and that is we've seen um, multiple op-eds from kind of establishment journalists, I'd say, Nicholas Kristof, Tom Friedman, some others. And um, in those op-eds, we've also seen former diplomats connected to the U.S.-Israel relationship kind of broach this issue of conditioning uh, military aid to the country, something that's come up many times through the years, but nothing has really come of it. Um, I'm wondering, you know, a lot of this seems to be in response to not specifically connected to the situation in Palestine, but connected to this specific government and Yahoo's judicial, uh, proposed judicial reforms. I'm wondering what you make of some of these recent calls and uh, people addressing this issue finally of conditioning aid to Israel. Do you make anything of it? I do. I think it's very significant that you have these mainstream voices adding their voices to what has been a demand from Palestinians for decades, been a demand from organizations in the United States organizing for Palestinian rights to try to get some accountability and um, action around the fact that Israel utilizes the weapons that we provide as taxpayers to it on a daily basis to enforce a brutal, violent system of apartheid against the Palestinian people. And even though these particular mainstream commentators are not situating the conversation in those terms, I think it's an important opening that allows other people who do have that more fundamental critique and who are centering the impact of these weapons, the devastating impact that these weapons have uh, on Palestinians is something that uh, opens the door to those conversations and allows those perspectives to finally, uh, after many, many decades being long overdue, to finally be heard in official Washington. You're somebody who has looked closely at the history of this relationship. I'm wondering if there, in your opinion, there's been any precedent for this level of kind of mainstream scrutiny of Israel. Um, Is is it parallel kind of anything else that's happened before? It seems like we are reaching a new threshold of what is considered um, tolerable, permissive in terms of mainstream discourse, in terms of the wide variety of actors that we're seeing saying that giving weapons to Israel free of charge is no longer a strategic necessity or a good economic idea. So in that respect, I do think it's unprecedented. But what's not unprecedented is the fact that the U.S. has actually held Israel accountable by either withholding or conditioning uh, weapons before when those U.S. weapons have been used either in violation of U.S. law to inflict gross violations against civilians uh, or that which contradicted U.S. strategic objectives in the region. So we can point to a number of historical 
uh, pinpoints in which this type of pressure took place. Going back to the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s, there were three different occasions on which the Eisenhower administration either threatened to withhold weapons, um, threatened to withhold other forms of economic assistance, or actually did follow through on that because of Israeli obstinance. And if we look at more recent decades, we saw, you know, due to Israel's unwillingness, for example, to uh, conduct additional disengagements from the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, from the Golan Heights in Syria, how in the 1970s, the Ford administration re-embarked on a reorientation of U.S. policy, which threatened the ongoing uh, nature of these weapons flows for quite a long period of time. And then what might be surprising to a lot of your listeners is that the Reagan administration actually imposed sanctions on Israel twice, Uh, one in response to Israel's attack against the Iraqi nuclear reactor in 1981, I believe, when they held up the delivery of F-16 fighter jets as a result of that military operation. And more significantly, I think the Reagan administration actually cut off cluster munitions to Israel because of the devastating impact that these weapons had against Lebanese civilians in Israel's war uh, on on Lebanon in the 1980s. So there are a number of historical points that we can look to to say that even some of the most uh, the presidents who are considered to be the most friendly to Israel in, in retrospective, even they were willing to. Uh, impose conditions and to apply sanctions on Israel. Surely if Ronald Reagan could do it, Joe Biden can do it as well. You've written an entire book on the Obama years and um, Israel and the Obama administration. Um, The Biden administration has criticized the Netanyahu Netanyahu government publicly. Um, You usually see like a State Department spokesperson expressing concern about things like settlement expansion or further annexation or these judicial reforms. But of course, we've seen little in way of policy action, as you just alluded to. Do you make anything of the disagreements that we've seen between the White House and the current Israeli government? And do you see any of this leading to any actual policy changing changes? Um, or are we just seeing kind of a repeat of what we saw under Obama? It's a great question. I think there are similarities and differences between the Obama administration and the Biden administration. The biggest similarity you already alluded to was the fact that both of these administrations have leveled some serious criticism uh, against the Israeli governments, especially as it relates to the ongoing illegal colonization of Palestinian land. Of course, that's not how they term it, but that's how I term it. In that regard, they've also both been very similar in the fact that, yes, there have been absolutely no consequences for Israel continuing to pursue Uh, policy with which the United States fundamentally disagrees. So the fact that the idea of conditioning or withholding or limiting or uh, sanctioning these weapons flows to Israel um, hasn't come up in the Biden administration and won't come up in the Biden administration definitely mirrors the same uh, lack of consequences that were a large part of the reason why the Obama administration's policy was so uh, unsuccessful toward achieving Israeli-Palestinian peace. So there are definitely a lot of similarities. What I would say uh, is the big difference is that President Obama invested a lot of political capital in terms of attempting to restart the Oslo peace process, quote unquote. Uh, The process of Israel and Palestinians sitting down and negotiating all permanent status issues. They tried that on two different occasions, towards the beginning of the administration and then again towards the end of the administration, and on both accounts failed. But the Biden administration has been very clear that there is no possibility of sitting down and convening negotiations, and that they're simply trying to preserve the prospects for these negotiations to potentially take place at a later unspecified debate and hope that the door remains open for some kind of eventual two-state resolution. Now, of course, both the Obama administration and the Biden administration, I think, understood internally perfectly very well 
that there was not a possibility of establishing a Palestinian state. And in fact, you had the Secretary of State during President Obama's second term, John Kerry, say so explicitly when he began his tenure as Secretary of State. Let's not forget that he testified to Congress, I think this was back in 2013, that there only existed a one to one and a half year window of opportunity for there to be a Palestinian state established. Otherwise, it was simply impossible with the rate of Israeli colonization. So that was a whole decade ago. And I think that there are plenty of people privately in the Biden administration who would acknowledge that off the record. But of course, no uh, uh, American politician, especially those in the administration, are yet willing to discuss what comes after the two-state resolution paradigm has failed, and it has failed. And this inability to grapple with the realities of the situation on the ground very much limits the creativity and the uh, imagination of the United States of what it's going to take to bring about an end to Israeli apartheid, an end to Israeli military occupation, and the establishment of some form of equality between Palestinians and Israeli Jews, which is really the only option left at this point. Stephen Simon was the National Security Council Senior Director for the Middle East and North Africa, long title, under the Obama administration. And he has a new book, or I guess it came out April of this year, in which he argues that the what's referred to as the special relationship between Israel and the U.S. no longer holds any strategic value for the United States. Um, that was a subjective question, but I'm wondering, do you agree with that analysis? Do you think that Israel no longer holds any st- strategic value from the perspective of Washington? I'm honestly not sure that Israel has ever been a strategic asset to the United States. I know it's touted that way um, by APAC and by other upholders of the special relationship, but I think that there are actually very few tangible outcomes that one can point to over the last 75 years that justifies that assessment. You know, since the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s, Israel lost this uh, card that it frequently played during the Cold War that were somehow the bastion of uh, U.S. Cold War interests in the region. And so there's been a turn in the rhetoric, and this was very evident, especially during the George W. Bush administration from the then Israeli Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, who tried to uh, place Israel's um, interests squarely in the framework of helping the United States prosecute its so-called global war against terror. And going to great lengths to try to convince the American public that the Palestinians Uh, were an extension of this global war of terror. But, you know, I think that on the whole, and I'll, I'll speak very carefully here so that I'm not misunderstood here. On the whole, I think Israel has been a drag to U.S. strategic interests in the region, whether one thinks that those uh, strategic interests are, are a good thing or, or a bad thing. And what I want to point to is that if you look at how Israel tried to position itself after September 11th in this country as somehow a helpmate to the United States in prosecuting the global war on terror, if you look at the words of those who were responsible for the heinous actions of September 11th and the indiscriminate terror that was inflicted on the inhabitants of New York City and Washington, D.C., that day, they say very clearly that it's the U.S. provision of weapons to Israel that in part, not in totality, but in part motivated their hatred toward the United States and convinced them to engage in these horrific acts of terror against civilians in the United States. So with that fact in mind, I think it's very difficult to argue that Israel has ever been a strategic asset to the United States. So I'm not sure that this uh, new argumentation that somehow something now has changed, that Israel is no longer a strategic asset for the United States in the region, I'm not so sure that that argument holds water. But I do think it's significant that people in such a mainstream position as Steve Simon was would be making that argument today. And finally, you know, connected to that, um, if Israel is not connected to the U.S.'s strategic interests. Um, despite that, they obviously still, uh, you know, support it, support the country. 
How much of that support in your mind is connected to the lobbying efforts of groups like APAC domestically? I mean, we're talking about tons and tons of money here. How, how much how, how much do you factor that in when we talk about this consistent support from Israel, really from both parties? I think it does play a huge role, but it's certainly not the only factor in why the relationship is the way it is. I think there is a lot of merit to the claim that there are shared values between the United States and Israel. I don't think that those shared values match what the supporters uh, of that argument uh, try to make, but I do think that there is a lot to be said for the shared settler colonial identities of the United States and Israel. And there's been a number of really well done uh, academic books that have pointed to the Old Testament as providing a framework for understanding the European settlement and conquest and elimination of the indigenous population as being a motivating factor and a justificatory factor in that process of settlement colonialism. So I think there's a strong argument to make that when the United States looks upon Israel and what it's doing toward the indigenous Palestinian population, they see a reflection of its own settler colonial past and present in terms of our horrific history of uh, eliminating and trying to erase the indigenous presence in this country. So I do think there is a lot of affinity, a lot of shared values in that regard. And I think that for many, many decision makers uh, who come from a background that either ignores or supports and justifies that kind of settler colonial past uh, of U.S. history, I think for them there is this natural resonance between the United States and Israel. So I think that that's always a background factor in these discussions of U.S.-Israeli relationships that aren't always articulated, but that are kind of there as background noise. And I think that's important to always keep in mind when we're discussing it. But I do think also that the the lobbying efforts and especially the interventions in the electoral arena do play a extremely significant role in terms of constraining how most members of Congress feel they can think and speak and vote and act on this issue. Uh, Let's not forget the fact that the pro-Israel lobby, and here we're talking about APAC and its spinoff PACs and super PACs uh, and a few other organizations that have jumped into the game, spent an estimated $80 million trying to influence the last national congressional elections. That is an astronomical sum for any lobbying organization on any single issue, much less a foreign policy issue. So, of course, this plays a huge, huge role because as campaigns get more and more um, expensive in, in an exponential way, of course, candidates running for federal office are going to rely on our broken system of campaign financing that has really uh, opened the door, thanks to some terrible Supreme Court rulings in in the last few years, to really these unlimited amounts of uh, campaign dollars uh, attacking candidates for office, supporting campaigns for office. Uh, It really is a a terrible, terrible reflection of the the state of our politics in this country when the campaign finance laws allows for this. I want to be very clear. None of these organizations are doing anything illicit. They are taking advantage of the laws that exist and making very good use of it to influence the outcome uh, of these elections. Uh, but that being said, they're not they're not omnipotent. You know, they they weren't successful in uh, getting all of their favorite candidates elected and keeping out all of those who they didn't want elected. So there is a limit as well to how much uh, money in campaigns can be effective and an influence, but it nevertheless is a very strong factor. 
Well, Josh, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Michael. Now to Florida. The Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights recently announced that it was opening an investigation into Florida State University's handling of a smear campaign targeting one of its students. Ahmed Duraldic was elected FSU Student Senate President in June 2020, but immediately faced backlash from campus groups, pro-Israel organizations, and even local politicians over his criticisms of Israel. Social media posts Duraldic made as a child while facing Israeli oppression were dug up in the process. Michael spoke to Ahmed about the smear campaign, his original complaint, and the historic education department probe. So to start here, um, before we get to the actual investigation, I want for people who maybe aren't familiar with your case, you were elected student senate president in June of 2020. And for people who aren't aware, can you talk about when the smear campaign against you kind of kicked off, who initially um, started it, and how it picked up so much steam so quickly? Yeah, well, it was honestly a pretty crazy situation. So imagine, you know, you're in student government at your university. Um, there's something going down with the person that's leading the student government body that you're a part of. You know, they, they kick out the person that was in the student senate president position before me. At the beginning of summer, it was like June 3 or something of 2020. Um, And then by June 6, I was elected to replace the individual. And the individual, you know, there was already a spotlight on student government. People are already looking at everybody who's in whatever position. And they want to see what's going down. And, you know, for me, I was the first Palestinian, the first, you know, Palestinian Muslim to really take on that position um, in the history of the university. And once I took it on, like not even two days, I think that, you know, it was a Friday when I took the position. I think June 6th was probably a Friday. And then by Monday, there was already like a whole situation kind of starting to snowball. Like within two, three days, there was people making posts about me on like Facebook class group chats and people on Instagram saying all types of things. And it kind of just from there, it started with one student to a bunch of students, to then the university, to then, you know, po- politicians, to even then states and countries outside of America. I'm wondering if you could speak a little about the climate or the situation on campus at FSU. You know, we cover a lot of campus stuff at the site, um, various SJP groups, Palestine solidarity groups, and also pro-Israel groups. So for somebody who maybe doesn't know um, the situation or the climate at FSU, can you talk about that a little? Are there many other Palestinians? Are there pro-Palestine groups? How strong is the presence of pro-Israel groups? Um, you know, obviously, some of those pro-Israel groups were directly connected to this campaign against you. Can you talk about just the climate there when it comes to this particular issue? So when it comes to Palestinians at Florida State University, there's not necessarily a huge population of us there. Um, when it comes to organizations that represent Palestinians, you have the Students for Justice in Palestine. And there's also, you know, the Arab Student Union, which is an organization that was founded, I want to say, maybe a year or two before um, the situation. I think even a year before I started at Florida State. So I want to say it probably started in 2018, something like that. Um, And the Arab Student Union was an organization that was meant to, you know, be a safe space for any Arab student, not just Palestinians. But, you know, that wasn't even enough because at the end of the day, we don't get as much support as any other group on campus, you know, just being an Arab, you know, there's a lot of groups that do support, you know, the idea of, of Israel and and this, you know, beyond. Cause when I was in student government, there was always this thing that you have to go on these APAC trips. They're going to take you to DC. They're going to take you um, all the way to Israel. They're going to take you here. They're going to take you there. Um, they're going to give you just, you know, all these gifts and shower you into believing that Israel's a democracy. And that was kind of the perception that most people had. And so for me, being a pro-Palestinian and being very vocal about the fact that, you know, Israel is an apartheid state, those are people that are committing genocide, apartheid. They're doing all the things that, you know, humanity should not be doing to each other. And, you know, standing against that is not something that people take lightly. It's something that, you know, people may be offended by because to them, you know, how, how could this perfect democracy in the Middle East be doing all the things that I was saying? 
The complaint refers to the fact that FSU stood by while this hostile environment ballooned, um, this anti-Palestinian environment. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the school's role in this whole saga and how they handled this campaign against you. Well, the school, you know, didn't do much, if I'm be honest. Like, it was, they didn't do much, but they did too much at the same time, if that makes sense. Like, there was a lot of different moving parts at the university that were trying to have conversations with me and trying to engage to see what the best way to resolve, you know, to resolve the situation would be. But there was a lot of outside forces that were trying to ensure that it ended in a specific way. So you had, you know, these politicians reaching out to the university and their administrators telling them this, that, the third. There was even, you know, the whole, a whole caucus from the House of Representatives for the state of Florida basically trying to remind the university that they're publicly funded. And if they choose to stick by me and allow me to con- you know, continue in my position, that you know, the university is going to start losing money just because I'm there and I'm, you know, I'm an official representative of the university at the time that now this individual doesn't represent you know, their view of what a representative of the university should be. Even though I was elected by the students, elected by my peers, it didn't matter. It was... I'm not the image that they wanted. Therefore, the university needs to get me out. And, you know, with that being said, the university itself didn't take any clear actions, but there was a lot of things happening that made it very clear that the university didn't necessarily want me in that position anymore. You know, one thing that made it pretty clear was I had a conversation with Hillel at FSU. It's an organization that's um, supposed to be a safe haven for Jewish people, but it, it doesn't necessarily just serve as that. It serves as a place where, you know, people who support Zionism stand. And I'm not somebody who's pro-Zionism. Um, I was actually called a terrorist by uh, Dan Lesham. I think he's like the head of Hillel or something. He's like one of their faculty advisors or faculty people, like an adult in a sense, someone that's not a student who works for that organization, um, decided that it was appropriate to to call me out of my name. And, you know, beyond that, I made the complaint about it. Nothing happened. I told the university administrators, like, you know, it's inappropriate to be referred to like that. And then, you know, the university itself, even the administrators, they put out announcements about me. They even put out a statement um, at one point, you know, labeling me as anti-Semitic. And then to go even further, the university president sent me a direct letter that was, you know, personally from him to me, Uh, informing me that, you know, he's lost utter and complete faith in my leadership because of everything that was going on and and how it was playing out. Um, And because I'm a a Palestinian who's not going to hide my identity at the end of the day, I'm going to stick strong to who I am and and the truth of, of, of what's happening around us. You know, I was in the position for almost seven months, I want to say. And the only reason that I ended up being removed was because of the university, um, you know, and couldn't do anything themselves. Like the administrators couldn't remove me from my position. And so there was students who were, you know, part of the secret society on campus, Burning Spear, and there were students that were, you know, kind of wanting to be a part of it, but not yet, um, that were starting to target me. And they started to file Supreme Court cases, um, like within the student Supreme Court, the student government Supreme Court. And because there was so many Supreme Court cases against me, you know, none of them were sticking. And then they started like they started to stick. And then I think there's like there was a rule. Um, It was a technicality. That's the word I was looking for. But because of the technicality of having those Supreme Court cases that started to come out in decisions against me, because, you know, the cases were saying that I was defaming a student senator. Another one said that it was my fault that the previous student student senator was removed, um, the previous student senate president. Um, and so I was being ha- held liable for a lot of different actions that weren't necessarily my own. Um, but because of it, I was, you know, deemed unfit to serve anymore by the judicial body of student government, even though the legislative government, legislative branch of the student government had full faith in me. Um, and they, they suspended me from student government for over two months. And the university waited and waited like the administrators. So Dr. Heck, the vice president of student affairs was the person who would be able to judge whether or not to overturn the decision of the Supreme Court in student government. And so I was appealing, you know, the decisions that got me removed. And she took almost two months to decide on them. And she decided in my favor, but she decided after the fact that I was no longer eligible to run for Senate president. 
and no longer really able to do anything that would help keep me in a position to actually serve my students and serve the student body. I'm wondering what your reaction was when you first heard that the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights was opening an investigation into this uh, over two years after you initially filed the complaint. And I'm also wondering what you hope happens as a result of this probe, what you hope comes out of it. Yeah, so for me, when this opened and when I first found out that it was being opened, I was I was honestly just shocked and in disbelief at the fact that finally a step forward. You know, it had taken so long to even hear anything that now, you know, any news was great news. And so I was stoked, ecstatic. I told my family immediately and then I kept I kept it pretty low key until, you know, Palestine Legal decided that they wanted to share the news because at first, I, I honestly wasn't sure, like, does this mean that we're getting somewhere? And, and you know, inshallah, hopefully we do. That's, that's all that this is about, is really getting closure and justice for not just me, but for Palestinians in general on any campus, anywhere in the United States, because we shouldn't feel afraid to be ourselves. We shouldn't be worried that because I'm a Palestinian, I'm going to be targeted and labeled this way. No, I'm a Palestinian and I'm proud of it. But at the end of the day, if I want to serve my, my people, I want to serve the student body that I'm, I'm here with, I should have a right to do that without people trying to impede on me because they believe that my experience and my lived experience is invalid. You know, we see situations like yours. We see um, anti-BDS laws being passed throughout the country. We see all these civil rights lawsuits filed by pro-Israel groups to go after critics of Israel. You know, the byproduct of this is obviously um, a climate of intimidation, a, a situation where many students throughout the country, um, even if they care about this issue, maybe don't want to talk about it or don't want to join an organization connected to it because they see um, what could happen to them potentially. Um, I'm wondering, you know, having lived this for years now um, and uh, getting to the point where now it's actually being investigated by the Department of Education, I'm wondering what you'd say to students who care about these issues, but also maybe attend schools similar to FSU where it's not a popular stance or there isn't much support. What would you say to them? I'd say stand in your truth. Don't sit down. Don't let anybody take your your identity from you don't any don't let any of these these entities these people these situations that are meant to break you to actually break you because you're stronger than any person will ever tell you and you're limitless beyond your own belief so i would i would say stay strong i would say be yourself and i would say never let up because once you do then you're allowing the people who believe that you were a failure and that you would never succeed to actually win because you know how strong you are and you know that no matter what these people are saying, that if you're standing in your truth and you're standing on the side of justice, there's nothing that should be able to stop you except God. This is great. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Yeah, of course. You know, I'm here and I'm grateful to be here and always ready to fight the good fight. So I appreciate you guys for having me. And, you know, thank you for always, always being a great news source. That's our show. Thanks to Josh Rubner and Ahmed Duraldic for joining us. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication with no paywalls. If you would like to support our work, please go to mondoweiss.net slash donate. Please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find the show. Subscribe to one of our free email newsletters so you can stay up to date on events in Palestine and related politics here in the U.S. and around the world. Finally, if you have any more feedback, send me an email at dave at mondoweiss.net. Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with a new episode.